Hey students, welcome to week three of English 475 online. This week is going to feel um, pretty intense in that you are, will be taking those outlines that you worked on last week and you're going to um, write them into rough drafts and you will be posting them on the discussion board this week. And you'll be reading each other's rough drafts and you'll be giving each other some feedback. Um, and then you'll be working that rough draft and revising it and turning it into a polished final draft. So that's a lot of things to accomplish in just one week's time. You can do it though, um, as long as you set yourself some daily goals and try to take care of um, something on the essay just a little bit every day. I wanted to say thank you to those of you who showed up for the live chat last week. Um, it always is helpful um, to show up and um, talk through the essays. Um, some of you know that sometimes you, you get stuck and you feel like, oh, I don't know how to start this thing, or what should I do to, to even you know begin to put words on a page. And sometimes just talking that through with your professor and your classmates can be helpful. So um, specifically, if you were stuck or you were challenged by that outline, um, I have some um, ideas here for how to write an introduction um, for your essay. So let me actually see if I can move this around a little bit. So the introduction. There are um, ways to write effective introductions. Um, writers don't oftentimes um, just know exactly what they want to say and how they want to say it, right? They have to have strategies. And so what I am going to give you is um, a few strategies that you can use with this particular essay. Um, if in the event you did not like what you already wrote on your outline for your introduction. But an introduction should accomplish three things. One, it should catch the reader's attention. So it should be um, really captivating, it should be intriguing, maybe full of lots of description, which you already know since you're writing a description essay that it should be full of lots and lots of description. Um, two, a really good introduction should announce the subject and the tone of the essay. So we should know fairly soon in your essay how you feel about that topic, right? Um, Gary Soto's The Jacket, um, as soon as we're introduced to the jacket, he tells us that it is the color of day-old guacamole and that the lining of the jacket is mustard color. Um, and both of those things suggest a tone that he does not like that jacket. And again, that's fairly early on in the essay. Three, um, your introduction should lead nicely into the rest of your essay. So it should, it should feel like the first part of sort of getting to know you and getting to know your story here. You should have a specific introduction strategy. Um, never just begin without thinking about how you're first going to present the essay. Um, I find that with a lot of my um, um, students who are in this particular class um, never actually really thought about strategies before and so oftentimes they're really stumped by um, a blank page and they stare at a blank page and they feel like well why isn't it coming to me why can't I just put my ideas on a page and and again I'm telling you from a writerly perspective that having a strategy is the best way to go about these um, writing essays so remember too um, the introduction is our first um, thorough um, introduction to you as a writer and it's really important to set your reader up not just for the essay that you're writing but also um, you want to make a good impression on your readers um, of course your readers include your classmates but it also includes your professor as well and so you want to make sure that um, it's you've thought about this and you put a lot of time and energy into the introduction Again, let me see if I can kind of manipulate this around into your screen there. So introduction types. So um, on page 83 of your book, there's a whole bunch of different introduction types. I'm only just going to list a few here that might be helpful um, in this uh, class. One, you can ask a provocative or a disturbing question to begin your essay. And again, these are just lead-in types, right? We wouldn't just ask a question and then um, drop right into a body paragraph. You would want to answer that question and then develop that into your thesis. So it then becomes just a strategy, um, maybe your first sentence or your first couple of sentences of that introduction. 
With the question though, let me um, be very clear about this. This is a weird way to start a personal essay. So if you are writing about your magical place to play as a child, it's kind of weird to, to ask a reader um, in, in the introduction to say something like, um, did you ever have a pool when you were a kid? Right? Because the reader's reaction is going to be like, no. And then you're going to just start talking about your pool. So I would strongly caution you against asking a question in this particular essay. It actually works much better with the next essay that we'll be going into um, in the following week. So please try to not ask questions um, as a lead-in type this time around. You can use a, an anecdote, which is just a usually a brief um, and funny story, um, you know, as a way, again, to sort of lead into the rest of your essay. You can offer a quote from a relevant source. Um, I've seen that work well um, with some essays. Again, I, I'm not sure it's the best way for a personal essay, um, just because you're going to be talking about your life and your memories and your experiences when you were younger, and so sometimes that doesn't make for um, good connection to relevant sources. You can cite a little or known shocking fact or statistic. Again, that one would probably be better in a research paper or an argument essay. Um, you can begin with a striking example. That's another good way um, for a uh, description essay or perhaps a brief dialogue. So mistakes to avoid. Do not make an announcement. And when I say don't make an announcement, what I mean by that is I see students a lot of times try to do things like um, um, they'll use a definition, like a dictionary definition. Friendship is the relationship between two people, right? Um, and it just, it's very clunky and it can feel very elementary. So try to avoid those kind of general statements. Make sure your introduction is short. We don't want it to take up a full page, especially in a short essay like this where it's two and a half pages, right? Make sure you avoid statements that discourage your readers from continuing on. And you're probably thinking to yourself, well, what does that mean? I've seen students write things like, well, this isn't very interesting, but I'm gonna tell you about a time that I, I tripped and fell. And a statement like that would discourage a reader from continuing on because you've just told us that it's not very interesting. So try to avoid things like that. Also try to avoid a, a overly casual or kind of chatty tone. Um, and what I would say with that is um, be aware of language that isn't academic or appropriate um, for, uh, for your college essays. So again, I've seen students um, write in a bunch of curse words or slang words, and that kind of language is best reserved for speech, um, probably outside of the, the context of this class. Make sure that your introductions are also clear. You want to make it clear where you are in space and time and how old you are. Um, you, it, it, writing an essay is not a mystery. We shouldn't have to sort of figure out um, where you are, um, again, in space and time. And if you want more of those mistakes to avoid, go to page 86 of your book. So here's an example from an essay we do not have time to read, but it's a really um, wonderful professional essay by Susan Strait, and it's called Crick. And the way she begins this here is just sort of giving a general description of um, the canyon where, um, the, where she used to play as a child. So I'm just going to read that to you. It wasn't really an arroyo, always a romantic word to me. An arroyo is a canyon where water has trickled away the earth, where trees have taken root, a place with a name. Our magical stream was really a drainage ditch, a flood control channel carved starkly into the fields between a shopping center and the railroad tracks that bordered our elementary school in Riverside, California. And again, that's just the first paragraph of her essay, and we get some really nice, um, description here, but essentially she's just sort of defining the place where she's at um, in time and space and being, again, very, very clear about that. Um, the next example you should recognize, um, and this is Gary Soto's The Jacket, and he begins his essay, as you know, with a really um, striking or intriguing statement, my clothes have failed me. 
when I read a sentence like that, I the first thing that comes to my mind is to ask, wait a minute, what does that mean? My clothes have failed me. Did a zipper break? Did a button pop off? How do clothes actually fail you? And you know, because you've read this entire essay, that this jacket fails Gary Soto in that he um, feels like that jacket brings sort of negative um, outcomes for him. People see him in a negative light. He's treated badly. He even um, ascribes um, failing, I think, or getting a D on a math quiz because of that jacket. And so for him, this jacket sort of symbolizes these really tough middle school years for him. And that's how his clothes have failed him. So again, he begins that with a, a really striking statement there. Another essay that we will not have time to read um, in this 14-week um, class is um, by my uh, Robert Bausch, My Father's Dance. And the way that he begins his um, essay is the way that I would actually recommend a lot of you, if you're really struggling with how to begin this, you can describe a picture. And in our narrator's case, and I'll read this in just one second, the essay is about his father. And so what he does to begin the essay and later to end it is he describes this picture, this photograph of his father on his desk. So it says, on my desk is a picture of my father, age 72 or so in his pale blue pajamas, wearing a round top, one inch brimmed white hat and dancing with his great grandson, Brandon. My father is really dancing. A wide grin is on his face, his hands outstretched, holding on to the little boy's hand. My father is in bare feet, one foot high in the air as he kicks to the music. I know, without having been there, what song he is dancing to. The fact that I know that, that I can look at that picture and hear the music, and that everyone in the picture is smiling and laughing, is a measure of what I remember from my childhood. So again, we get this really great description here um, uh, that helps us understand what the essay is about, the father, how the narrator feels about the father. And in this case, it sounds like he really loved his father um, because he says, you know, it's a measure of his childhood and here his father is laughing and dancing. Plus, we get some really great description of the father himself. So introduction types that do work well with this description essay, um, one are an intriguing statement, two an anecdote, so just a brief um, short story um, that's obviously related to the subject matter that you'll be talking about. You can also do a really um, wonderful description of an object that again is related um, to wherever you're gonna be talking about or whatever you're talking about for your description essay. Or lastly, a brief dialogue. Um, all four of those I've seen work really, really well with this particular essay. Moving on, I'm going to talk about the conclusion. Again, um, the conclusion, just like the introduction, should always have a um, strategy to it. You should never really begin your essays without thinking about how you're going to end them. So um, I want you to think about your conclusion being the last moment with your reader. So you really have to finish strong here. You want to make sure that the essay feels like it's finished, that you've answered all of our our questions and you've um, left us left with a less excuse me left us with an impression so um, for many um, students I have heard them tell me that their former high school teachers or their um, middle school teachers or somewhere along the line someone told them to restate everything in a conclusion and what I tell my students is that if I wanted you to restate everything that you just told me in your whole essay why would I bother having you write an essay I just have you write a really amazing conclusion and that would be it so restating can be an effective way to end an essay, but typically I would say that that's more effective when you have a longer essay and you need to kind of remind a reader of the major points that you've already covered. In this particular essay with the description, restating everything you just said is, is not a good conclusion. It's really redundant um, and it's just, um, it's boring for a reader, so don't be boring. Um, so be awesome.
So a conclusion paragraph, just like an intro, has several functions. One, it's going to leave the reader satisfied, which means that you don't stop just because you've reached the page limit, but you've kind of come um, full circle and you've finished telling us the entire story. Um, it also is going to tie together all of the developing ideas into the essay. Again, that doesn't mean to restate the thesis, but you might want to touch back on the thesis as a way to, again, sort of remind us of how you felt about that or maybe how you've grown from that moment. Um, again, think about this as your final moment with the reader, so make it count. Um, I would add to that, this is my final moment, um, excuse me, this is the last thing I'm going to read of yours before I assign a grade to your essay. So really make those conclusions count. I feel like sometimes students think that those are the things they should spend the least amount of time on, and I actually would sort of argue um, in, in the opposite direction of that. Exits can be hard. Conclusions are really tough. As much as I write, you guys, it, it's still really hard for me to sometimes to, to find what I need to say at the end. So again, use that thesis to kind of help guide you and use these strategies as a way to help you as well. And again, these are all on page 88 of your book. So if you need more of these um, suggestions, make sure you turn over there. So an example um, of a conclusion strategy that I might use in this essay is an image or a description. Again, this whole essay is description, so you never want to stop being um, descriptive or concrete. You constantly want to use those concrete details to help make your world come alive. But this can be a um, strategy in which um, you're giving a description that sort of lends itself to the finality of the essay. And again, Gary Soto does this really well in his essay, The Jacket, as you know. And how he does this is we know that the life of the jacket is sort of over at this point in time. And he gives us some great description of being called to dinner, right? We get these really wonderful um, um, concrete details, eagerly ate big rips of buttered tortilla that held scooped up beans. Oops, I noticed, just noticed a typo right there. Um, so we get that imagery in, and then we get this sort of moment um, where he's in the alley, and he puts on the jacket the green ugly brother who breathed over my shoulder that day and ever since. And again, that's imagery he's already used in the essay, but here it works because now we understand that this time with the jacket is over. Um, he, he's, he's worn out the jacket at this point in time. So again, you can do something like that too, especially those of you that are writing about um, objects that defined you for a period of time. Um, maybe the conclusion should be your last moment with the article or tell us what happened with it, um, perhaps. So the next strategy that I would um, perhaps try to use is um, sometimes what I call broader implications. Um, with the description, sometimes I call this um, and now. So if you think about maybe the past, um, how might it have an effect on you and maybe your future? So with Susan Strait's Crick, she spends the whole essay talking about this beautiful arroyo, um, which wasn't actually very beautiful at all, but to a kid, it was incredibly beautiful because they just had a little bit of water sort of trickling down in this flood control channel, and there were broken bottles and the glass sort of shimmied or shimmered off of the water and the sunlight, and so it just kind of became this wonderful, magical place for her. So this is her final paragraph here of her essay. It says, It is impossible to compare our childhoods. I'm certain that all parents, mine included, find that same impossibility when they hear me talk about my own childhood, because they knew of nothing we did. But I often feel that my children have lost out because they don't have a ditch, the necessity to make their own crick, or the freedom to wander through the vacant lot with their friends and sit for hours carving a canyon in an arroyo with their feet in a few inches of water edged by fool's gold. So notice here that she kind of tied it into this idea of her own children not having a place to play like that um, and how that kind of makes her a little sad and, and a little nostalgic for what she does have or what she had as a child. Again, you can do that as well. Um, sometimes, let me just go back one second. Sometimes what I tell students is if you are writing about a magical place to play, tell us in your conclusion what happened to that place? Um, maybe you moved and now when you drive by 
that house? What do you think of or what do you see? Is your tree house gone? Is your playhouse gone? Did it get thrown away? Did it get gifted away? Where, where is it now? Um, okay, and the last strategy I'm going to give you here with the conclusion is to come full circle. So again, if you use a technique like Robert Bausch does in My Father's Dance, where he describes the photograph of his father on the desk, you can come back to that technique you used in the introduction. And this final paragraph of this essay says, so now whenever I look at this picture on my desk, I remember all those years I was my father's son. I remember my mother's laugh and the way she made me think of somebody other than myself. I think of my brothers and sisters, nieces and nephews, and all of their children. I remember my own children and all the years of loving and cherishing them. And I realize that in spite of change and sadness and loss, and in spite of the withering passage of time, my father is still dancing. So again, the writer's just coming full circle here, returning to the technique that he used at the beginning of his essay. Um, and um, I don't know if you could tell just by the, the tone of this paragraph, but in the essay, the father actually has pa already passed away. And you can kind of sense that in the conclusion, because that's why the photograph has become so important, um, that the writer can look at that photograph and remember his father, and his father specifically dancing every time he sees that. So mistakes to avoid. Um, of course, avoid boring mechanical endings. I never want you to write anything boring anyways, but in particular, try to stay away from those um, um, summaries or um, really expected ways to um, conclude your thoughts here. Don't introduce new main points or irrelevant materials, so don't start telling us about a story that's kind of related but kind of not, because now you're just taking us on a whole new journey. Don't tack on a conclusion, and again, what I mean by that is just to sort of... Um, to, just to start with something like, in conclusion, um, my childhood was fun, right? That just feels, A, really general. Um, it feels like something um, anyone could, could write. These are your stories. They're about you. Um, and so make them as unique and wonderful and um, personal as, as you really are. Um, I have a... a and a piece of advice right here that says don't change your stance, that really just applies to um, argumentative essays. Um, if you begin arguing um, for or against something at the beginning of your essay, you never really want to change that by the conclusion. It doesn't really apply to the essay we're working on now, but it's something to remember for the future. Um, avoid trite expressions. In conclusion, in summary, as you can see, these three in particular are overused and they're really, really boring. Um, and they've just been used way too many times. So find other ways to try to conclude your essay. And then lastly, don't insult or anger your readers. Um, again, this is all on page 90 of your book if you would like to um, refer back to that. Okay, let me see if I can get out of this and take you to the last thing here, which is really about description um, revision. So once you have written your rough draft this week and you've posted it on the discussion board, you are um, hopefully going to get some really great adv advice or questions about your essay and you can take that into consideration and you can revise your essay. Um, what I have noticed is those people who do spend a, a lot of time revising their essay actually end up with really, um, really strong uh, final drafts of their essay. So you want to spend most of your writing time doing revision. So some of this stuff is going to seem um, redundant because I just finished talking about um, introductions and conclusions and things like that. But again, um, if you are um, working on your rough draft or you haven't finished your rough draft yet, you might want to pause this video and come back to this moment. Just make yourself a little note, like come back and watch the rest of this because I'm really telling you now how to take your rough draft and to um, make it into the best final version that you possibly can. 
I have a uh, quote from Ronald Dahl here, who many of you probably um, grew up reading his works as he was a children's book author, but he says that good writing is essentially rewriting. I am positive of this. And um, again, as a writer myself, most of my writing time is actually spent in revision. So I 100% agree with that. So if you are not spending as much time revising as you did in writing the initial essay, you are probably not doing something correctly. So I'm just going to touch on a couple of quick um, punctuation and grammar things um, because in your final draft of your essay, I do have the expectation that this is going to be an almost perfect draft. Um, in that, it should be free of um, typos and grammatical errors. Your sentences should be grammatically correct, the syntax should make sense, um, the ideas should develop well, and we should have lots and lots and lots of concrete description. So. Here is um, just a brief definition of what a fragment is, and it's it's essentially a sentence that isn't a sentence. It actually is either lacking a subject, it's lacking a verb, or it fails to express a complete idea, but it's punctuated like a sentence. And so that's the problem here. And so you'll see in red, it says, although I was eating, that's actually not a complete sentence. It's just a clause here. Same thing here, since he was unwrapping presents. Again, there's kind of no back half to that sentence there. Um, for those of you that are native speakers, you might actually hear that. Um, you, you almost are kind of waiting for the rest of the information. Here's another fragment, grandma making tamales. So in order to fix this kind of sentence, we would just say grandma was making tamales or grandma makes tamales. Um, making is not a, um, a verb all by itself. It's usually a helping verb there. So the easiest way to find fragments is to read all the way to the period and kind of stop and listen. This isn't um, always going to work, especially if you're not a native um, English speaker. Um, but for those of you that are, this might be a good strategy for you to try to find fragments for yourself. Um, if you need to fix a fragment, right, you can you can combine it with the sentence in front of it or the one behind it. Um, sometimes I find that just rewriting the sentence can be the best way to kind of handle that. So tense. Here's another thing I would watch out for in these essays. Um, many students go back and forth between present tense and um, past tense. So I'm going to just show you what that looked like right here. So in this red sentence, it says, I devoured the pumpkin pie. Now I am eating frosted cookies. So notice here that this verb has an ED, right? And right here, we have present tense. So between these two sentences, past tense, present tense, we've switched tense. So be very, very careful of that. Um, again, I see this all the time. I would say that maybe 50% of my um, students um, writing this essay tend to switch tenses back and forth. So the easiest way to um, look for those tense those tense shifts is to look at just the verbs in the sentences and make sure that they're all in the past tense. Most of these essays should be written in the past tense. They're kind of a little funky if you do them in present tense. Um, so comma splices. So one of the most common um, comma mistakes is actually just putting two sentences together with a comma. And um, something that's really, really important, if there's, you know, one thing I kind of want you to remember, right, it's, it's this comma rule right here. So, um, and it says comma rule number two, and that's because eventually I'll get back to one. Um, but, it's, but when you have two main clauses, right, you can join them in in one sentence, um, but you do have to use what's called a uh, coordinating conjunction. And so the best way to remember a coordinating conjunction is this acronym right here. And this stands for for, and, nor, but, or, yet, so. Okay, if you need to write that down again, for, and, nor, but, or, yet, so. So notice here, this is not because, right? So if you want to put two complete sentences together in the same sentence, you're going to use a comma and a fanboy. So here we have the first clause. I don't know her, comma, but I like her. So both of these things are complete sentences. I don't know her and I like her. And if we wanted to put them in the same sentence together, we have to do a comma and then the fanboy. Okay, if you were to just do a comma, that's what's called a comma splice, okay? Here's another example. The tableware in the restaurant was exquisite, comma, and 
the food was some of the best I have ever tasted. So again, just notice that that fanboy, here's a third example, I'm gonna not read that, but if you wanna pause that to take a look at it, go ahead. Um, so when conjunctions join other parts of sentences, such as two words, two phrases, or two subordinate clauses, do not put commas before the conjunction. So essentially all I'm saying here is, hey, just because you have a fanboy doesn't mean you automatically have a comma that goes in front of them, okay? So look here at this second example. It says we always have a turkey and pyramids of tamales. When, be, just because we see this and here does not mean that there's a comma here. In fact, if we put a comma here, this would be wrong because we don't want to separate pyramids of tamales from the, um, the noun and the verb, right? This is all one, one sentence right here. So be careful. You want them to be complete sentences on the other side of the comma and the fanboy. Okay. So introduction, again, don't forget about the introduction and the um, functions that it has. Um, please consider what your peer reviewers say about your intro. If they felt like it could be stronger or if they had questions from the beginning, maybe this is a place where you can revise, right? You really want to ask yourself, is my introduction doing all that it should? Does it actually grab the reader and does it have tons and tons of concrete details? Sometimes students think that they have to wait um, to have concrete details until the actual body paragraphs and the answer is no. You really want to pull your readers in with some exciting and fresh um, description and you might as well start doing that in the introduction itself. So that's a place you can revise. So if your introduction type isn't working, go ahead and try something new. Um, why not? You can try a book ending technique like writing about the photograph. You can just try some really great um, snappy description that maybe starts the beginning of your story. You can try an anecdote if you would like that kind of captures the tone or description of the topic that you're, you're writing on. So um, thesis, um, we haven't talked a whole lot about that with this description essay and um, I'm partly holding off in a lot of ways because the thesis with a description essay, because it's a personal essay, can feel a little funky here. Um, and so again, I'm not going to spend too much time on that, but all a thesis is, is just the main idea and your opinion of, of that main idea. So in Gary Soto's The Jacket, he says he blames his jacket for the bad years. Um, this tells you exactly how he feels about the jacket. He's blaming it. He hates this jacket. Um, it's really depressed him and made him feel terrible about himself. So um, if you have a, a thesis in there, you should definitely check it out, make sure that it works. I have here read it aloud to your group, but obviously like we're not in a group right now. So, uh, but maybe you have someone at home you can actually read your essay to. That does help sometimes. So think about your organization. Um, many of you are telling stories um, about something that happened to you, and in that case, your essay should be organized um, chronologically, which just means time order. Um, for those of you who are writing about a place, you might want to use a spatial organization. So that just simply means by space. Um, and then lastly, I have most to least or least to most. That's, that's just sort of a logical um, way to organize. But again, you should think about those things. Maybe that's a place where your essay could use some clarity or some revision. I'm just reminding you here about showing versus telling. So let's look here at this first um, example. By tradition, we have tamales, pozole, menudo, mole de pollo, turkey, and stuffing. For dessert, there are tamales de dulce, pies, oh, not pies, pies, um, bonuelos, and arroz con leche. And notice here, for some of you, that might have started to put images in your mind, right? But for um, some readers, it's actually just a list, and it doesn't really do anything um, in terms of being vivid or descriptive. Same thing here. Um, this came right out of a student essay from a few years ago. It said, the gifts for the adults may include hairspray, shampoo, and conditioners, toothpaste, toothbrushes, mouthwash, and cleaning products. Um, and again, this just feels like a list of stuff. Um, and, it, and specifically, I think that student was writing about a Christmas um, exchange. Notice this one right here. It says, the snow white pot with flowers on it was now covered with streaks of dark orange red juice from the menudo running down the side. 
This is a really great description. Not only do we have the contrast of the white pot, right, and the, the orange red juice from the menudo, right, we can just see that. We can see that sort of oily juice running down the side. So that's a really great description. Again, that actually does come from a student essay here. Um, here's another one. The fat marbled the hefty chunks of beef, leaving an oily and savory soup for the colorful array of vegetables to soak in. So again, this fat of the um, beef here is a really vivid description. So notice the difference here. These descriptions on the left side of your screen aren't very effective. They just become lists of things and they're kind of boring. Over here, we have showing, we have concrete details. This is exactly what you wanna go for in every single sentence in your description essay. So if you don't have the showing going on, if you don't have the concrete details going on, you should be revising those sentences. You should be adding in more and more and more and more concrete details. Precise language. So again, think about strong nouns and verbs. Use those five senses whenever possible. If it's really hard to get in those five senses, sometimes with smell and taste can be kind of hard, you can use a simile or a metaphor if you'd like to um, as a comparison. Don't be vague. Um, in every sentence, again, be vivid and be fresh and be um, like, let us feel that we are there in your memory or um, in your home or wherever. Um, watch out for overly general descriptions of words. Um, I caution you around words like somebody, anybody, nobody, anything. These are all very, very vague. And last on here, I have never ever use a cliche. Um, be careful of this. We use cliches all the time in speaking because they become shorthands for um, description. And so sometimes when we go to write our essays, we might say something like, it's raining cats and dogs. And although that feels specific, it's actually not really. Um, because what we don't do is picture what kind of rain it is. Um, we just picture maybe kind of a, he a heavy rain. We don't literally picture cats and dogs falling out of the sky, right? However, if I were to use a strong noun or strong verb in a sentence to describe rain, um, it might actually um, create a picture in the reader's mind. So let me see if I can make one up here. Um, let's see if the rain... The rain fell from the sky and slapped the concrete in big wet kisses, right? You can almost hear that kind of description, right? You can almost see that kind of rain splatting down against the concrete walkway, right? Um, so again, try to make sure you're using precise language at every chance that you get. Lastly, again, think about that conclusions. They really should feel like an exit. Um, if they don't, rewrite it. Try a different conclusion type. Don't be afraid to rewrite a conclusion. Sometimes students don't want to have to rewrite things because they feel like it's a waste. And what I think is a waste is turning in an essay that you did not revise well enough, that you knew you kind of had a crappy conclusion and you just left it in there anyways. Um, you're gonna be very disappointed with your grade if you don't really try to um, get the most you can out of your own writing here. So lastly, I have some revision techniques for you. Once you have that rough draft done, you should read it aloud. And I know what you're thinking to yourself. If I read this aloud right now, right, people in my house or my parents or my siblings or my kids will hear me and they'll think I'm crazy or something, right? But the thing is, is your brain is so smart that it can take words on a page that you wrote and fill in the words that aren't actually there. Um, even if you have words missing, excuse me, if you have misspellings, um, that's how our brains work. It sees what it wants to see. However, when you read things aloud and actually speak them aloud, your, your brain slows down and it, it, it reads very literally. So this has become a really great technique for myself personally. Sometimes I read emails out loud if they're really important emails because I'm trying to catch my mistakes. So especially if you're the kind of person that misses a lot of your own typos and grammatical errors, read through your essay aloud. Another strategy you can use is to read 
um, sentences backwards. And what that means is not to start at the period of a sentence and go all the way to the very first word of a sentence, but it's actually sort of to read out of order. Um, you might start at the bottom of a paragraph, right? And read that sentence from the beginning of the sentence to the period, but don't read the sentences in the right order. What this does is this allows you to concentrate on the sentence level stuff instead of concentrating on the, the whole meaning of a paragraph. Um, again, you could, you well, hopefully you will read each other's essays. It's worth some points. Um, but giving each other really helpful feedback for that peer review. Um, be honest with people. If it seem, if the introduction seems confusing, right, just let them know and say, hey, I really liked your essay. However, I was really confused um, where we were. Um, I wasn't sure, you know, you said that there was a pool, but I wasn't sure that this was a family pool or a community pool or whatever the case is. Um, so try to give really, really helpful feedback for that peer review. And if you try to give helpful feedback, that means others will too. And so hopefully you will get some really great um, feedback from the peer reviewer. You can go see a tutor in the Language Access Center. Likewise, you can click on Smart um, Tutoring I believe that's a link there um, on the left side of your toolbar in Canvas. Um, and you should be able to get some feedback from a um, tutor. Now, I do caution you with the smart thinking tutoring. Um, you don't want to send this to them and expect them to turn around in, you know, five minutes to you. I don't think that's how it works. You have to give yourself a couple days um, time to get that stuff back to you. So you can come and see me as well. I have an office at the Rancho campus in LA-123, um, and I have office hours, um, which that means that I am in my office, um, usually with a line of students out of it, um, but you can certainly come in and bring me your rough draft and we can talk about it and I will give you some strategies. Um, so those are the times that I'm there. Let's see, I have a couple more things I wanna to talk to you about. So just touching base with you with uh, week three, I do want you to read some more in the steps. Um, so you'll be reading about um, introductions, you'll be reading about conclusions um, in these pages right here. In these pages you'll be reading a, a couple sample essays um, which are very helpful in terms of um, my expectations. It kind of sets you up to know well how much description is is Vicki looking for? Um, so please pay attention to those those pages. Of course, I always say read and take notes. I do want you to read and take notes on Annie Dillard's um, Amer An American Childhood. Um, you can just click on this blue PDF link and it should take you right to that file. Um, you don't have to answer the questions at the end of that essay. I just simply want you to read it. Um, you're already watching my week three lecture, so yay for you. You do have a quiz by um, Wednesday. Your rough draft, is your discussion board this week. So there's no other discussion board that you're gonna be going back and forth of. So you'll wanna work on that rough draft um, and that needs to be posted to this um, discussion board by Thursday before 11.55. Um, once those rough drafts are posted, you have until Saturday to read through two classmates' essays and give them constructive feedback on their um, essay. And I'll give you some more um, tips on how to do that on the actual um, discussion board. Um, again, these are all worth points, so make sure you don't miss out on that. Make sure you revise your essay so um, you go back through and read the comments that you've gotten back on your essay. And then you're gonna make sure that you upload the final draft of your description essay to turnitin.com by Sunday. Um, if you have not registered on turnitin.com, make sure that you do that. Um, but your uh, drafts of your essay will all be posted up on turnitin.com and that way I can give you feedback um, on the essays and grade them on there. If you have any questions or concerns or problems, make sure you email me uh, and let me know sooner than later. I will host another live chat this week and I will send out an announcement um, probably on Monday to let you know when that'll be. So have a great week and I'll see you on the discussion board or in the chat room. Bye.